Hello and welcome to the Building Sustainability Podcast. Every month, join me, Geoffrey Hart, as I talk with designers, builders, makers, dreamers and doers. We're exploring the wide world of sustainability and the built environment by talking to wonderful people who are doing excellent things. This month, I'm talking to Rob Hopkins. Rob is an activist and a writer on environmental issues based in Totnes, England. He is best known as the founder and figurehead of the Transition Movement, which he initiated in 2005. Rob is also a founder and director of New Lion Brewery, which is a social enterprise craft brewery in Totnes. New Lion Brewery aims to be built on the foundations of sustainability, profitability, community and innovation. In 2015, its Pandit IPA was voted Britain's 17th hottest beer. So I spoke to Rob uh, before he was doing a talk in Canesham, put on by the uh, Transition Canesham Group. Uh, He was doing a talk uh, supporting his new book, From What Is to What If, Unleashing the Power of Imagination to Create the Future We Want. I have listened to the audio book and it is an incredible book uh, that's so, so very inspirational. So I interviewed Rob at the Kingsham Baptist Church, uh, which uh, I discovered its existence when I went and did my civil duty to vote uh, just before Christmas. They were very kind and let us use one of their their rooms um, so that I could interview Rob before he went on stage and and did his talk. Um, You can hear at one point uh, the minister dropping in uh, uh, the invoice for the uh, the room and being slightly surprised that he was being recorded. I'll be back at the end just to give a round up and to let you know what you can find in the, uh, the show notes of this. Oh, one final word of warning. This podcast does include a few naughty words. Uh, so if your ears are very sensitive to naughty words, maybe don't listen. It was a, a yeah, a really nice thing to listen to. Oh, good. Um, yeah, I was slightly intimidated because you're incredibly good at asking questions. Am I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, and I, uh, I just thought, oh, I need, I need to up my, <laughs> my question game for this. Well, I normally, because all, all of those kind of imagination-related podcasts, mm. I had most of those people I interviewed, I had very specific things I wanted out yeah. of those people. You know, so it wasn't just a general chat. It was like, I read your book and I love that bit and I want to know more about that bit. Yeah. So it would kind of work like that. Oh, nice. Well, that's, that's, yeah. Hopefully then, because I've read your book. Good. Uh, Thank you. you know, Good. Uh, uh, I can maybe do something the same. I mean, actually, that's a slight lie. I listened to the audio book. Oh, good. So I hearing your voice. Is... recording that thing. I'm glad you listened to it. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because since doing the podcast, I sort of understand a little bit about editing. I okay. could hear sometimes when the, the intonation would change. Yeah, there were because, and, and, and well, actually, well, then what happened was that I came back in. So then it went, it got sent off to the publisher. Right. And they came back with this whole list of bits I cocked up. Right. Know? Particularly, there's the bit where I have to pronounce the name of that Icelandic volcano. Yeah. <laughs> or something. And, uh, and, I, and when I was recording it the first time, I just said, and that Icelandic volcano with the unpronounceable name, they said, no, 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 you have to pronounce it. <laughs> but, but when I came back in to re-record the bits I'd messed up, I had a cold, so my voice was like a couple of yes. notes lower. Ah, so they ha- took, and it took ages to get warmed up. So there are places where the, where it dips. Yeah. yeah. It was amazing. Like, I like having worked on, you know, having done like full days digging foundations for houses or straw bale or, you know, doing lifts on cob walls. Yeah. I have never been more exhausted than coming <laughs> home after a day recording an audiobook. Really, literally, I came home at seven o'clock. I went straight to bed. I was like, I am so tired. <laughs> did you do it all in a, a single no, day? No, I did it in two days. I was going to say, that was like that, eight hours of... <laughs> God, you get sick of the sound of your own voice. Well, luckily, I didn't get sick of your Oh, well, I'm delighted to hear it. That's great. <laughs> <clears throat> mm. So, uh, I quite wanted to start 
at uh, Transition Towns. Yes. If that's okay. Yes. Um, because I, in my sort of small little bubble, everyone knows about Transition Towns. They know what they're about. Uh, and then I was talking to some people who I was doing some green wood working with. And I thought, you yeah, know, they're green wood workers. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm going to speak to Rob Hopkins next week. He's, who? Yeah. Who? <laughs> and then, and then, uh, and I said, oh, oh it's yeah. that wanker. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it's a better response than that. Uh, but then I said, you know, uh, have you heard of Transition Towns? And they went, what? <laughs> you know. Uh, spent too much time in the woods. That's, that's, no that's probably it, yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, it seems like, yeah, the people that know really know and the people that maybe don't are, are completely oblivious. So could you sum it up or, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, for me, transition was something that we started in 2005, 2006 mm-hmm. as a uh, as a kind of a, what would you say, like an investigation or an experiment to say, what would a response to climate change look like mm-hmm. that was not, that was a compassion-based response to climate change? That okay. wasn't saying, like at that time, there were loads of people who were like, oh, my God, we must go and live in the mountains with four years' worth of baked beans and toilet paper yeah. and small fire, you know, firearms. And it's all about us and protecting mm-hmm. our kind of thing. You know, it's a prepper mentality. Prepper stuff. Yeah. And, um, and I thought, I can't really see that working in Devon. <laughs> I mean, where would I go? Would I go to Dartmoor? And actually, you know, that whole thing of, all right, so if I've got a garden full of vegetables and I've got four years worth of firewood and everybody around me is freezing cold and starving, what am I going to do? Am I going to, am I going to, am I going to sit at the gate with a shotgun or am I actually going to say, come and yeah, let's, let's figure this out together. And I I couldn't see much at that time that was an exploration of how do we figure this out together? Mm -hmm. And in the context where you have governments that aren't moving quickly enough, if at all, and where you have business who aren't moving anywhere, what, what's the bit that we can do here now without waiting for anyone's permission and just based on what, what have we got? Who have we got? What's, we got straw bale builders. We've got farmers. We've got a housing crisis. Crisis. We've got da, 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 right. Okay, we don't need anyone to change any legislation or to give us a huge grant from central government. We mm-hmm. can figure this out between ourselves, and we can do something. So it was always an exploration about what can we do here from this place. What are the solutions that we can create here? That if someone came in from the treasury with a clipboard, they would have no idea because <laughs> we're from this place and we understand this place yeah. and we know what its needs are and we can set out to do that. Based on the idea of how do we also think about how uh you know what are the opportunities that that process of decarbonization brings about uh-huh. and how can we get pe- how do we i'll talk about it later tonight you know it's like how do we create a deep longing for a decarbonized world and how yeah. do we start to give people tastes of it in their everyday life now so we start to change the story so we started it down in Totnes and, and you know now I think we think of it because it then spread so you'll find transition in 50 countries and thousands of places transition Canesham tonight transition Canesham who are hosting tonight you know and so that I, I always say it, it is a movement of communities who are reimagining and rebuilding the world uh-huh. and that balance between reimagining and rebuilding is really really important because if all we just do is just do stuff yeah. without taking time together and think and think and dream and imagine what we could build or alternatively if we all just sat around and dreamed all the time it's not much use mm-hmm. so finding the balance between both of those things is really important but the key point is it's based on that idea of how do we have an economic model that starts with this place and how we make sure that resources circulate as many times as possible here yeah. uh, before they leave. So, you know, there, there are, I'm sure there are people in Totnes who've, no, who've never heard of what, what transition is. And I'm sure there are some people who think it's completely mad. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I've never been anywhere where everybody, you know, so we have this idea sometimes, well, you can only change something if everybody in a place is really up for it. Yeah. Actually, you need like three or four percent of people. Who want who pull their finger out and decide yes. they want to do something, like and actually an idea can grow really quite quickly. Mm. And if for me, it's all about how do you start quite quickly to tell a different story, to create stories that can spread. A lot of what we've done in Totnes is being a bit like a sort of story generator and throwing them out into the wind and see where they take root. And what what sort of uh, stories would they 
would they be? Well, I guess like, one of the first things we did was the Totnes Pound, which if most people anywhere in the world know one thing about Totnes, it's the town that printed its own money and had a £21 note because yep. we could, you know. <laughs> and uh, which, which, which we stopped in April because the circulation was falling because nobody really uses cash anymore. So yeah. Yeah. But it was wonderful for 12 years living in a town where you could use your own currency with people you'd chosen on it and that told the story of that place mm-hmm. and that could only be circulated locally. If you took it to Plymouth, Exeter, Newton Abbott, it had no value at all. But in yeah. Totnes, it was very, it had a value. And what, what is the, the, the sort of value in keeping that, that local? Uh, you know, why, I was, why, why use that above other currency? Well, you could, I mean, you don't have to. It's not, it, it is a tool. You know, mm. So it'll actually, you know, if there was a big group of people in Canesham who said we need a Canesham pound and they were really up for doing it because it's quite a lot of work to yeah. do it. But if you get it right, it is a really beautiful tool for getting people to think differently and for getting people to think about the local economies in a different way. Yeah. It can be a brilliant thing. Uh, and, you know, oh, yeah, we're off, but it's OK. Go on. Oh, thank you. Oh, this is the minister. That's right. I'm oh, Kevin. Nice, nice to meet you, Kevin. So are you? Thank yes, you for yeah, your yeah, support. You're on. <laughs> You're famous. You're going to be a star. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so it, it's something that, 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 that is a tool that people might use. But, but the, the idea behind it, whether you use local currency or whether you don't, is... You know, before I did all this, I was a permaculture teacher. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that you always talk about in permaculture is a place where you start. Bill Mollison, who was one of the founders of it, always used to say, if we lose the universities, we lose nothing. If we lose the forests, we lose everything. Mm-hmm. And it was because the forests are where you, you, where you learn is where the model is for how you do things. Yeah. And so I always talk on courses about when you look at a forest, the way that a forest manages water and nutrients is is amazing you know from when it the the rain lands on the leaves and they break it into a fine mist and it's stored on the leaves or in the leaves or on the bark mm-hmm. or in the soil which is like an enormous sponge and you have this whole process where that water is then kept and moved very slowly and carefully through that system you know if donald trump designed a forest you'd have big guttering around the trees and as soon as it hit a tree it would be in a gutter down off into yeah. a big tank owned by him you know so there's something beautifully distributive and uh, complex about about woodland and we should be looking at the economies of the towns and cities where we live in the same way mm. the money that comes into that place should do as many different things as possible before it leaves so if everybody in that town shops in a massive aldi on the edge of the town all that money just leaves it has yeah. no loyalty or connection to that place whereas if you shop in local independent businesses much more money and economic benefit stays to the town it supports families and who live there and their money stays there and then they su- use local suppliers and then so so the more you build that picture of saying how do we get the money to stay here and do as much as possible that feels to me like that's the the big economic story of the 21st century if you look at what they're doing in preston the preston yeah. model they're doing that on a city scale mm-hmm. driven by the city council with phenomenal effects. You know, they were Price Waterhouse Cooper did this big survey of what are the most improved cities in the country. And last year it was Preston. Yeah. They've made twelve thousand new jobs, you know, millions of pounds they're now circulating in the city, using that to start new cooperatives, look at food in different way, energy in different way, housing in different way. Because when you have a model where you keep the money locally, mm-hmm. you can make more decisions. You're not just sort of there with a begging bowl while Aldi and Amazon wander off with all the money, (laughs) which is why, you know, on the Bristol Pound, in very, very small, tiny writing on the Bristol Pounds, it says, keeping money out of the Cayman Islands since 2012, (laughs) you know, which is fundamentally what the idea of whether it's a local currency or whether it's just a different economic approach for that place, that's what they're about. Because the the Preston model, that's not, they haven't got their own own money. No, they they don't. No, no, but they have the... They have the spending power and the political muscle that a that a city council has. Yeah, that's why what they're doing there is so exciting. I think. I mean that that what twelve thousand new jobs. That's an incredible amount. There's a new word I heard that they that they I don't know if they had coined it in Preston or they nicked it from somewhere else, but they talked about insourcing. You know, okay. we're, we're so used to this idea that actually the economic progress comes from outsourcing as yeah. a result of which we have no manufacturing of very much left in this country at all. They talk about insourcing, which is so, for example, if the council own a housing estate 
and they need to do maintenance work on the housing estate. The first thing you do is not put a tender out to a company to, to come and do the servicing. The yeah. first thing you do is look and say, well, who lives on this trading estate and what skills do they have and how can we create work for people who already live here? Mm-hmm. And uh, that that's just brilliant, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, a fundamental shift. Just uh... A complete shift because actually what it does is it cuts out the sort of... I don't know. It's, it's like what Naomi Klein calls the extractive economy. You know, this sort okay. of idea. You know, we, we we need to get our heads into looking at if you have a Costa on your high street, if you have a Starbucks or a um, <clears throat> whatever on your high street. They're basically like an enormous leech mm-hmm. sitting on your high street. They don't give a shit about that place. Yeah, they're there as an extractive business to to take money out and to. And to kind of uh, concentrate it somewhere a long, long way away. They they don't play on the same playing field as local independent businesses do, mm-hmm. and uh, that that economy is still growing and growing. And, and actually, it's one of the things. You know, I came here from Totnes today. You know, we have we're one of the very few places I think in the country where eighty percent of the businesses on our high street are small, are independent local That's businesses, fantastic. but they're under so much pressure and so much threat. But mm. it's still like. That's that's the foundation that you build on and you build out from that. You don't sort of see that as being disposable and whatever. You know, actually, that's a really, really precious thing. Yeah. Did you, um, I've, I've only, maybe only half remembered this, but in Quick Owl, didn't they, uh, they uh, were threatened to have a Costa or a Starbucks and they said, well, you know, we can't compete with, with that. And so their solution was to take their entire town's uh uh, banking offshore so they could compete with it it was a tv program was it they did a tv program where they where they went around and visited and tried to figure and try to get their heads around how all of that stuff worked did, did they actually do it because i've heard yeah, i'm so not sure was, I, 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 there was a program where they which was about them figuring it out i don't know what they then actually did right yeah. I yeah i much prefer the you yeah. know well I, I, t- I don't know if i fully agree with yeah the if, it's sort of if you can't beat them, join them, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, much it was rather. very thought provoking. Very, mm. very thought provoking. You know, well, like it really helped me to get my head around how all that stuff works. Now you yeah. set up a company in in Holland, which is registered in the Isle of Man, and then how you know it's just madness. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. far removed from you know the, from the from reality. And from the world and tangible stuff and people, you know, because, we, you know, we're living in this time where we're living in an epidemic of loneliness and we have this sort of what people are calling the age of anxiety and mm. people are more and more isolated and in their own little bubbles and everything like that. You know, for me, one of the one of the things about local currency, I remember reading this study from Bristol that said if people went shopping with Bristol pounds, they had something like 20 more conversations than if they just went shopping with a plastic card. Right. And it was always my experience when I went shopping with Totnes pounds in my town was that people go, Oh, I love it when people bring these in, they have a whole conversation. And you think actually, you know, when, when, when we wrapped up the Totnes pound in April, we had this whole, uh, kind of, um, so we put on this evening, we thought, well, we don't want it to just sort of fizzle away. We're going to say, okay, that was brilliant. We loved it. It was great. We did yeah. an evening called A Celebration of the Life and Times of the Totnes Pound. And it was really lovely. And we talked about, well, it, so do, was was this a success or a failure? Mm-hmm. You know. And actually we said, well, if, you, if you're looking at it as being something which the aim was for it to become the currency of choice for everybody in Totnes, then it, then it failed. Yeah. If you look at it as being the most brilliant community art project that involved people in thinking about economies in different ways, it was amazing. If you look at it as something that really put the town on the map as somewhere just really thinking outside the box and being really gutsy and having a go and trying things out, it was a real success. If you look at it as being something that got that, that generated conversation and got people talking to each other, which mm-hmm. is essential to building resilience, yeah. then it was a brilliant success. Fantastic. Yeah. There's um there's a part in your book which we'll talk more about in a second, uh, where there was oh I forget where it is but they were printing printing money. Yeah, in um, Walthamstow, the bank job project. Yeah. Yes. Although that's not a local currency though. It's, no, it's but like it, it, you just suddenly made me made me think uh, yeah. that that sparked so much joy in my life. <laughs> uh, I brought some along tonight. I'll show oh, really? you. Really? Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I then I went so the. 
Well, can you explain? Uh, yeah, it's they're... a couple called Hilary Powell and Dan Edelstein. He's a filmmaker. She's a printmaker. Mm-hmm. They live in Walthamstow. They were really, they were really kind of upset seeing the impact that austerity was having on their on their neighbourhood, mm-hmm. and the rise in use of food banks and the rise in sort of food poverty and stuff, and debt in particular, and debt indebtedness. So they thought, well, what could we do? about it you know rather than just starting a petition or something and, mm-hmm. and then the last bank on their high street closed in Walthamstow their cooperative bank closed so they they took over the bank and turned it into what they called an act of citizen money creation where Hillary brought in a team of printmakers who screen printed and block printed and gold foiled these beautiful notes that weren't a local currency they were more like collectible mm-hmm. limited bank notes which she signed them all as the bank manage, the manager of the, they called it the Host Street Central Bank, HSCB. And, mm-hmm. and it was, um, and there were four different people who were on the notes who were sort of local heroes who were catching the people falling because of austerity. So yeah. uh, people who ran the food bank and stuff like that. And um, the aim was to sell £50,000 worth of these notes. They were in different denominations. They uh, they sold £50,000 worth of notes and bonds. Later they started pr- issuing these bonds beautiful artifacts they're in the vna and all sorts of oh, stuff really? they're really Fantastic. beautiful yeah and um but the idea was they wanted half of that money to be distributed among the four charities on the notes mm-hmm. and then the really smart bit was that they then took the other half and they went to the secondary debt market and they used it to buy back payday lending debt for walthamstow so they bought back 1.2 million pounds worth of payday lending debt in walthamstow for 25 grand for 25 grand yeah because because the way it a whole world i knew nothing about like yeah. you know if you have a, if you have a parking fine for 100 quid and you don't pay it mm. after about six months of sending you snotty letters after a while they'll give up and select another company will give them two quid for it right because at least that's that's worth more than nothing that company then will come after you again more aggressively and less pleasantly than the previous ones yeah. for another six months to a year till you again don't pay it and they'll sell it on to someone else and this buying and selling of debt kind of junk debt was one of the key reasons behind the crash in 2008 oh, really? which, yeah it was when these massive bundles of 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 um in america it was um Mortgage debt. People get 100% mortgages. Yes, the the yeah, people yeah. who sold it them knew these people haven't got two dimes to rub together. They're never going to pay it back, but I get my commission. So mm-hmm. do I give a shit? And there was all this toxic debt in bundles that then people were buying and selling because it's like, hey, this is worth a hundred pounds. It's like, well, it's only worth a hundred pounds if Jeffrey's going to pay it back. Yeah. But it's worth hundred pounds, you know. So, so actually, they, they went to the secondary debt market and they bought back payday lending debt, which is the the, the debt that people at the bottom get most into trouble with, you mm-hmm. know. And they were able to buy one point two million pounds worth of it. They wrote to everybody because you basically you buy a spreadsheet, you yeah. buy you buy an Excel spreadsheet. And they so wrote name, to all the, names, addresses, names, addresses, money. amount, yeah. whatever terms or whatever. And they wrote to them all and said, you know, that debt you had. We've cancelled the debt. Good luck to you. Have a nice life. Oh, but by the way, and um, we don't expect anything in return. But by the way, if you'd fancy joining us uh, at a at a site overlooking Canary Wharf on the ninth of May at nine o'clock in the morning, you'd be very welcome. So p- people, and I, so people would turn up, and they what they had done is they bought this old transit van, painted it gold, right, uh, uh, written HSCB on the side, filled it with bits of paper with the word debt written on it, like you'd fill it with banknotes, mm-hmm. and then at, at ten o'clock in the morning or something, they blew the van up. <laughs> Uh, like, I guess it's going to be the... Because they're making a film about this whole thing. Yeah. So I guess it's going to be the kind of conclusion of the film, this massive explosion. And then they picked up all the bits of metal and all the bits of glass. So all the people who bought bonds, of which I was one, yeah. then they then they melted down a load of the metal and, right. mil- and minted special commemorative coins. And they sent you these funny little plastic sort of, like, display things with bits of broken glass in and all this kind of stuff. You know, it's just beautiful. It's like, you know... So so for me, the, the what's really brilliant about it is... If you're motivated by debt and the rise of debt in your community, you know, what can you do? You could start a website, you could start a petition, 
Mm-hmm. You could write to your MP. And I'm not dissing all those things. They all have a role. Or you could take over an empty building on your high street and you turn it into a bank and you have loads of people in there printing money and it's open all day and it's open in the evenings as a community education project about how the how economics really mm-hmm. works. And it's full of notes all hanging up on washing lines uh, to dry like uh, you know, like a sort of print works or whatever. And then you and then you do this van and you blow the van up and it, you know, it's just like there's something beautiful in that story for me about if we bring that kind of imagination to what we do, we can impact people so much more deeply because they they feel it and they associate yeah. emotions with it. It's not just all up in their head. Yes. Well, when I heard that bit, I was driving along and I was you know, beaming. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I listened to your audio book. Did we already talk about that? I can't yes. remember if we'd started recording or not. No, no we hadn't started. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I'd listened to your audio book and, um, yeah. There's uh, there's some some bleakness in there that I you know there's a few chapters which didn't make me feel great, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah that that last chapter was just full of I've looked up probably three or four of the, the things now and Good. just been so inspired. Good. Well, yeah, I, th- I think it's it's uh, I think anybody anybody who writes books in 2020 that don't have a bit of bleakness in them isn't paying, isn't paying attention <laughs> frankly you know for me like the the question is how do we you know particularly after the election and after you know after the the, the sort of the ending of last year yeah it's like well, where do we how do we find that balance between between recognizing the bleakness that's there but also recognizing that if we just sit in the bleakness, we don't we don't do anything. Yeah. And how do we harness? How do we how do we invite imagination into that space? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Because that's I mean that's the the crux of your your new book, isn't it? Imagination. Um, and well, the the title is from what is to what if, <laughs> unleashing the power of imagination to create the future we want. Think. <laughs> yeah. just edit that out. Sounds all right. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, from what is to what if? So that's looking instead of looking at what have we got right now, or so yeah, it's, it's about it's about. Um, so I guess the so, so sort of the, the the spark for it was I kept reading people who I really admire like Naomi Klein and Bill McKibben and people like that mm-hmm. George Monbiot who kept saying climate change is a failure of the imagination and I was thinking that's interesting by which time they'd have gone off and be talking about something else just this term kept popping up climate change is a failure of the imagination and I thought why would it be in 2019 that we're having a failure of the imagination mm-hmm. surely we're great aren't we 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 know we but but why would it be why would that be the case and then i read this research this woman did uh, a woman called kyung hee kim who was a researcher in america published a paper in 2010 called the creativity crisis where she looked at this thing called the torrance test for creative thinking this massive data set of people who had done this kind of creativity testing going back to the 1960s. Her conclusion was imagination and IQ rose together till the mid 90s. Yeah. And then IQ kept rising and imagination started to decline and has declined ever since. And when this was published, it was a really big deal and it was on the front page of Newsweek magazine. There was a lot of soul searching in America because I, you know, I th- we thought we were the best at everything. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, uh, actually China do most things making stuff better than we do now. And imagination's all we got left. Yeah. You know, if that's declining, we're really down the tubes. Because uh, we're increasingly like a sort of a creative industries based economy, you know, a bit like here. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I never heard anyone in the climate change movements or social justice movements say, "Oh, this is interesting. This is really important, actually." So that was kind of the starting off point for the book. Really, was to say, might it be that at the very time in history when we need to be reimagining and rebuilding everything. I and mean, when the IPCC said in their 1.5 degree report, you know, we need to see rapid, far reaching and urgent changes to all aspects of society. Mm-hmm. That's, that's an imagination project. If people can't, if people can't imagine that and see that, and if we aren't able as activists to create a longing for that, mm-hmm. then it's never going to happen. Right. You know, when we went to the moon in 1969, 
that that came about because we had spent the previous 50 years telling stories about going to the moon. Yeah. Tintin went to the moon. Jules Verne went to the moon. Everybody went to the moon. There were songs about going to the moon. Frank Sinatra sang about the moon. Every, it was all about this. So by the time we actually, Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, we'd actually been to the moon hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of times already, but in stories. Mm-hmm. And what that had done is it had created that kind of a really deep longing to make that happen. And once you create a deep longing for something, it becomes inevitable. Most of the sort of technologies that we have around us now started in science fiction yeah. and ended up becoming fact, you know. And so how do we create kind of transition fiction or, or sort of ways that really uh, bring that kind of future alive for people? Because otherwise it's not going to happen. So that's kind of the starting point of the book. And, and the thing that for me was such a joy about it it was a kind of two-year process to research and write it Mm -hmm. was that i uh you know i i guess i've sort of read a lot of climate change books that always tend to interview the same people right and there was a very deliberate attempt in this book to i want to write a book where most people have never heard of any of these Mm -hmm. people and and you know I guess probably of the hundred and something people I interviewed, maybe 20 of them I'd heard of before I started the project. Yeah. So it was really like, pick up, oh, that's interesting. I'd read something or somebody would mention something or, you know, so actually there's a whole load of people in there that I'd not even heard of before I started. And it was a fascinating kind of a journey. I particularly uh, enjoyed uh, the interview you did with, oh, I've forgotten her name now. Uh, she invented the, the genre Hope Punk. Oh, Alexandra Rowland. Yes. Yeah, she was I, great. Huh? She was fantastic. <laughs> I found it really interesting when she was talking about uh, how when sort of times are good, we we crave this grim dark. Grim like dark, yeah. The, you know, the, where everyone's like horrid. Like Game of and, Thrones. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then when times actually go dark, we're all now looking for uh, a positive, uh, you know, the hope punk. The, yes. I like the bit when she said... Uh, about how many, what does she say, you know, that, that most great stories start with somebody sitting drunk in a bar saying, I bet it can be done, sir. I bet it can be done, though. I don't yeah. know how, but I bet it can be done. You know, and we need a lot more conversations like that. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the, the term, you know, the, the what if uh, is a recurring, uh, you know, uh, sort of statement in the, in yeah. the book. Um and you know, you focus on a lot of uh, good examples of where people have done great things because of you know a simple question. Yeah. Uh, and what are what are some of the examples of of the, the great what if questions that that you've come across? Or that have spawned. Um, well, I guess know. I guess one of the things about for me about what if is is that it. One of the beautiful things about imagination is that it thrives best when you put limits around it Mm -hmm. so if i said jeffrey tell me a story you'd be like yeah what bewildered yeah bewildered. if i said tell me the story about a mouse that lives under that counter there Mm -hmm. who plays this piano as a tiny little piano tell me about that mouse you'd be off you'd be like oh his name's sam and he's really and he learned from his uncle who played in new orleans and (laughs) who came over here in a banana boat or whatever you know and and actually you know so in the same way that using haikus or you know um using rap or different different sort of um what would you say kind of like a uh, construct different constructs or dr seuss writing a book with 50 words or mm-hmm. you know there's an exercise i do in talks where you get people to tell a story like the whole room tells a story but using letters of the alphabet there was someone called alan who lives in bristol and he was a carpenter and did you know you tell a story like that um so for me there's something there's something really powerful about what if in that when you so if, if you're Donald Trump, for example, or Scott Morrison in Australia, mm-hmm. who don't recognize there's any limits to anything, climate change is a nonsense. We can get more, we can get infinite resources magically somehow. Economic growth, economic, the economy will just grow forever and ever. Actually, they are the most unimaginative people possible. The most imaginative people I meet are the people who really can see the constraints mm-hmm. and who are, but who are bringing imagination within that picture saying, oh, yeah, well, we could, da, 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 you know, like uh, the, one of the stories in the book about Liège, you know, like Liège in Belgium, oh, where yes, they started yeah. transition. And then they said, well, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in the city came from the land closest to the city? 
beautiful what if question because it's really invitational and mm-hmm. it invites people to come in with bits of the puzzle and they're now they now have 21 new cooperatives in the city they've raised five million euros of investment from local people they've got shops and farms and breweries and vineyards and just phenomenal mm-hmm. uh, but it started with that what if question you know for me there's the thing i always loved about natural building we were talking about before is actually there's something where if you say we're going to build a building mm-hmm. and all the materials are going to come from within five miles of this place rather than just saying we're going to pop down to juicens and we're just going to get whatever we can get there yeah when you actually and and his Historically, you know, as tourists, we love to go to, but we don't often go to Slough on holiday and walk around <laughs> looking at the lovely buildings. We might go to Bruges, we might go to, to Stratford, mm-hmm. we might go to, you know, some village in Devon. And the buildings that make us go, oh, are often the buildings that were built with things that could be carried to that place on a cart. Yeah. And they develop techniques and approaches and, and, and aesthetics a style, yeah. and a style and a kind of a finish and with, with the, a rose out of those materials. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a thing I always loved about that. And, you know, particularly like when I was first into straw bear building and stuff, there was a magazine called The Last Straw mm-hmm. from the yeah. US. Yeah. Every copy of that would be like, oh, my God, there's people building like straw bale and cob together and beautiful round bits and gorgeous windows and little alcoves. And and uh, um, and because they're because they're 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 recognizing those limits, but they're they're using that to flourish in Mm -hmm. in the same way that the like the the, the craft brewing scene, uh, loads of those places say we're going to brew using local wheat and local stuff. And we're going to that's going to be our strong point. And they're making beers that Heineken would not even dream of in a million years. And the same with food, like the whole local food explosion and how that's led to all kinds of flavours and tastes. It used to be 150, 200 years ago, you would travel around this country, different places you would go to, you would taste something in Sheffield that you could only ever taste in Sheffield. You'd never get that same flavour anywhere yeah. else. And that's that's what rec- li- working within those limits and those what-if kind of spaces brings about for me. Mm-hmm. You know, with the other another of the stories I know is about about Hodmedods, the company who make who grow English beans. Oh yes. Who, who yeah, started yeah. out transition Norwich and just said, What if Norwich could feed itself? Which is a limit, yeah. yeah. Right? It's not saying, hey, we're going to be forever part of this global food chain. They're saying, what if we recognized that our contribution to climate change was to grow as much of our own food as we could do? And then that led them on to saying, okay, so we're going to need to do rotation in the fields. What could we grow? What beans could we grow initially to fix nitrogen? And then mm. they found out that the beans that were grown locally to fix nitrogen, which they thought were just plowed back in or fed to cows or something, were actually exported to Egypt, where they were a complete delicacy that we used to make this particular kind of falafel people would eat when they broke Ramadan uh, fasting. Mm-hmm. And they were, thought, well, why don't we eat them here? And then <laughs> so it got them on this whole process of rediscovering English beans beans english pulses english grains that would grow here how you would process them so again it's putting the limits bringing a what if and then unlocking a whole lot of creativity that otherwise wouldn't come um it seems uh, what's what's the secret to a good what if question (laughs) uh i think it generally needs to come from more than one person okay that's interesting. I think it needs to be it needs to bubble up out of a con- out of conversations. Uh-huh. Uh it needs to um it needs to have enough space in it for people to come into it and to pick it up and so to it's shape not, it. It's not too prescriptive. It's um, not too prescriptive. It's very invitational. Uh it is held in a way that um uh it, well, it's it's rooted in it's rooted in a, a, a kind of a determination to actually do something with it. Mm-hmm. It's not just an academic exercise. It's not an intellectual kind of bimble. It's a it's a very tangible. It's an inquiry because it wants to go somewhere. Okay. Um, so not like a what do they call those thought experiments? Not. Not really. No, I it's think I think it, it needs to, it needs to it needs to address. It needs to be something that that makes people that that m- makes people's eyes sparkle. A bit, mm-hmm. You know, it needs to be something that that evokes our curiosity, and we go, hmm, yeah, mm. actually, yeah. What if it, ne- it needs to be something that? Um, that kind of uh, invites people to 
create a mental picture. Okay. So, so it's, it's like, uh, you know, what if the majority of food eaten in Liège came from land closest to Liège? That immediately gets you to think, okay, what would that land look like? Mm. What would, what would we be eating? What would the economy in which that food was being sold look like? Mm -hmm. So it kind of, it, it kind of evokes curiosity. Yeah. Which I think, you know, we're going to build a new Asda. Doesn't really do. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> what if we had another Asda? <laughs> yeah. I mean, is that great. the point of the, the Middle Isle in Aldi? It's just, yeah, it's, it's curiosity in there. It's curiosity. <laughs> you know, I think, I think curiosity is a much underappreciated thing. Mm. And, and actually, you know, you, you talked about, about bleakness, you know, I mean, actually for me, having written and done a lot of research about climate change and climate science and doing a lot of talks about that kind of stuff. Actually that, that chapter about education and schools mm. was almost as heartbreaking, if not more heartbreaking than that. Actually, you know, it's like that, that sense of, you know, we are, we're in the climate emergency and we have young people walking out of school all over the country in their hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And we, we need, you know, our survival depends on having, young people coming out of school who feel who are full of possibilities mm -hmm. and who feel like turbocharged to take this problem on and it's just not happening and actually it's completely the opposite you know we are kind of crushing kids imaginations by the time they're 11 and 12 mm. and um you know, actually, the, what, one of my favourite things that has happened with the book was it got reviewed in the Times Educational Supplement, okay. which kind of got by a deputy head teacher in a school. And one of the things she said was, yeah, we'd really like to kid ourselves that we're really building and developing these kids' imaginations, but we're so not. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've got friends who were teachers and have just, just got out. Yeah, and there's so many ex-teachers. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who's left in there now. It must be like two or three teachers. Just a few time. people like, <laughs> holding the walls in. Uh, so one of the things in the book was about uh, children's imagination and imagination with play. Yes. And I uh, heard that or read it. What do you say when you've had an audio book? <laughs> yeah, I heard it. Heard it. Uh and there's a bit about a, there's a relation between a relationship between how many toys you know the, yeah. the children have to choose from and you know the associated imagination of that child and then christmas came and i was with my family <laughs> uh yeah my my young nieces were you know unwrapping hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of yeah. presents and you know darting around between them and never really sort of completing a thought yeah. because they're on to the next thing and i yeah i've was, that resonated. Oh goodness! Yeah, <laughs> and actually, the reality is they'd probably be happier just with the boxes. Yeah. When yeah. I was a kid, I always just wanted my mum and dad to fill my garage with cardboard boxes, <laughs> so I could connect them all together and make like a house and tunnels. And there was a book I read that I loved. It was called The Three Investigators. That was a, it was like sort of you know child detective thing. Mm -hmm. And they had a base that was like under under the dump. They had like a it was like a caravan or something that was underneath a load of rubbish in the tip. So you had to get into it through a tunnel. Right. And I always wanted one of those and I wanted to build it out of cardboard. <laughs> they kept buying me presents. It was so much less fun. <laughs> yeah, I find all that stuff fascinating. So like the, the, there's a bit in there about Hello Barbie, that ghastly talking doll. Mm. So I've actually bought my Hello Barbie along have tonight. You? Yeah. Um She's always a, she comes to all my talks with me. Yeah. It's a shame she doesn't work because she was actually withdrawn from sale. Oh, really? Or the app was discontinued. So you can't actually, I wanted to be able to interview Hello Barbie live on stage right. about the imagination of young people. Yeah. But, uh, but you can't do it anymore. <laughs> <That's a shame. laughs> no imagination in that. No imagination. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, I just need to really ask you a strange question. Go on. I like strange questions. Um, have you have you been working for Ben and Jerry's? No. So I was in the cinema <laughs> the other day, and they big just before the trailers came up, Ben and Jerry's, and said, "We need what if questions. We need, uh, uh, yeah, we need imagination. If we can't imagine a world." And I wondered if a you'd been working with them, or no. b someone had read your book and then just possibly it straight onto this. Possibly. 
which is the least imaginative. Well, they aren't, <laughs> they, aren't, they, they aren't cutting me in on any kind of commission. Well, so. I'd be uh, expecting a pretty big <laughs> check from that. But that, um, I guess, uh, I wondered, my thought is on how, whether grassroots is more effective than sort of big big corporate change or big policy change as those two are quite it's different. really not an either or i think at this point we need any change Just, anywhere it can come from yeah you know like there are there are some companies who are really trying and who are really you know mm-hmm. like company like lush for example who are doing really fascinating things mm-hmm. and looking at, at their whole business model and or patagonia or companies like this who are doing some really interesting things about mm. renewable energy and you know, regenerative agriculture and stuff like that. While still being like a global... While still being... A, yeah, and I think they're all very much aware of the of the kind of... What would you say? Like the, the discrepancy in that, really. Mm. You know? I had a I had a whole thing... So I go on the Eurostar a lot because I don't fly. Mm-hmm. And I... Uh, they have these horrible adverts for BP on the on the stations, mm-hmm. and I wrote this. I wrote a letter of complaint to Eurostar saying you can't allow this company to greenwash all this stuff about. You know, we see possibilities everywhere. It's like no, you don't, because ninety seven point five percent of your business is still basically oil and gas exploration. Yeah. The fact that your funding is a bit of solar doesn't make you part of the solution. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I got this. I kind of got fobbed off a bit by Eurostar, so I published all the exchange I had with them on my right. website and copied. BP in and I got rung up by the guy from BP who was behind that advertising campaign and we had a really interesting conversation uh, where he was saying you know we really feel like we're you know in this team here we're working really hard to try and you know I said yeah that's fair enough you know I I don't mind the fact that you are saying you know we're BP and we're Mm -hmm. trying out new things but your adverts should have a health warning at the bottom like cigarette adverts that say but 97% of this business is still oil and gas yeah and since and they you know they they spend 50 million dollars or something every year trying to weaken uh, legislation on climate change you know that that it should be but then actually as you get better and as it becomes just 90 percent or then 80 percent then the health warning under your adverts changes mm-hmm. but you and he was like actually that, that's quite a good idea that actually <laughs> you know but actually you know, there are people in those places who are trying mm. but you know, it needs to come from everywhere. You know, I, I don't have a kind of, we shouldn't talk to business and we shouldn't talk to this. You know, actually, we need everybody. Yeah. You know, we need our grandma and our and our next door neighbor and uh, parents at our kids' schools and the companies we buy from and the train companies we use and the people we elect and everybody needs to be pushing on this. Mm-hmm. But it needs to be underpinned by... You know, I guess it's the point I come back to all the time is, you know, my wife's very involved in Extinction Rebellion. She's been arrested four times and very into it. And I've been up to the London Big XR rebellions and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a lot about it that I really, really love and admire. But I went up to Waterloo Bridge in April and they had these big placards that just said, we're fucked on them, (laughs) you know. And I thought, yeah, I can kind of get where you're coming from. And I think, you know, it's really important that we have, that we make spaces to have conversations that start by saying we're fucked Mm -hmm. because it's definitely a possibility. But all of those conversations have to also make space and make room for saying, yeah, but maybe we're not. And maybe we could actually see the most phenomenal transition, transformation, societal shift that in 2020 feels completely unimaginable. You know, going back to the beginning, we were talking about the moon landings. Mm-hmm. You know, actually, the, the average age of the people in that team that put the men on the moon was 26. Wow. You know, a lot of them came straight out of university. And they, and, and the guy, uh, and the guy who you hear on all the, who's the main guy talking to them, who I can't remember what his name was, but he, uh, he said, it, he said it was important that we had that because they, they hadn't experienced failure. Right. So they kind of didn't include failure in, in, in their way of thinking, huh. you know. And so I, I, I feel like, um, there's a huge sort of lesson in there for us about, you know, really harnessing getting young people in the seat. And, and, you know, we have to have a narrative all while, while all the conversations need to say, this is a climate emergency mm-hmm. and we need to be doing something. All those conversations also have to include, but we could build something so utterly extraordinary now. And because just because our experience for all of my life as an activist and campaigner and whatever I've been 
uh, has mostly been about losing things. Mm -hmm. You know, I was involved in roads protests around here in the, in the early nineties. I was involved in the roads campaign against Salisbury Hill building the bypass right. around Bath. I was involved in, and you know, fighting against the Iraq war starting everything I've been involved in. I've lost, I, I, you know, I, I, the same. It's yeah. a default position. Mm -hmm. And every, it's, it's also everyone's expectation is, yeah, you lot, you'll make a lot of noise and then you lose everything. <laughs> You know, and actually, and we've come to internalize that. I think, yeah, we'll we'll campaign, but we'll lose. Actually, as a result of which, doing this work for years has felt like pushing a big rock up a hill, like Sisyphus pushing mm -hmm. this rock up a hill. As a result of which, I think we we tend to exclude imagining what it would be like to be on the other side of the hill, when you have business and policy making and finance and everything lining up to say we've got to decarbonize the shit out of this thing as quickly as we possibly can you know then actually what how how different is it to be a natural builder in a world where every one around is going how do we build houses using local materials yeah do you know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. it's unimaginable what that would be like to be in, what to, to be in that world. When people are saying, God, how do we do, how do we shift these economies in such a way that the money is staying here? How do we, how do we shift the schools so they're producing? It's like, you know, then we're in and, and the finance comes in and the policy making comes in. We have no idea of what that would feel like. Mm -hmm. But actually that it's that I think we're in that kind of tipping point at the moment. We're kind of on the top of that tipping point. And once yeah. we tip, we, we, ha we can't imagine what that will feel like. Pretty good. <laughs> well, exhausting. Wow. Well, but, yes. but but you know, it should be that it should be that I think, you know, if if we were to achieve being a carbon neutral country by twenty thirty, twenty thirty five, whatever. Mm -hmm. If we did that and we got there, you know, to go back to the moon landing thing, all the people actually went to the moon. When we went to the moon and we were able to be on the moon and look back and see the earth for the first time, we were not the same people after mm -hmm. that happened. You know, for me, it's like, actually, we can't imagine in 2020 what it would be like in 2030 to have actually achieved that. It would be an unprecedented achievement. People would tell stories and sing great songs about these extraordinary people mm -hmm. who did this amazing thing. You know, that's kind of what keeps me going is, is I want to be there when, when that happens. That's that's a very I think that's a perfect note to end on. Uh, <laughs> There's a lovely one of my favourite records is the Velvet Underground, 1969 live, and it has mm -hmm. the one with the ridiculous bottom on the cover. Oh yeah. But there's a bit in the sleeve notes of it that says something like, um, uh, "I wish it was 2050. I can't bear the suspense." <laughs> I kind of, I kind of feel like that, you know. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Sorry, it's a little bit rushed. But, oh no, um, not at all. Blame um, Google. Yes, of course. <laughs> for, For so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, I found it an incredibly inspiring talk. Uh, both this interview, the talk Rob gave... Um, and in fact, the entire book, um, while there was moments of bleakness, as discussed, uh, the overriding sense of, of what's possible and what we can all do um, to change to change our bit of the world, and hopefully the, the much larger world. Um, so uh, in the, the show notes, the accompanying show notes of this, I'll uh, put a link to the What If uh, promo video in which Rob does uh, an amusing walkthrough of a day in 2030, showcasing all of his um, his best imagined ideas of what that world could look like. Not now, bingo. Not now, bingo. Not now, bingo. I'll also put a link to uh, the Transition uh, Network, uh, a link to the HSCB, uh, the bank, bank job. They've uh, put a little video up of uh, of what they they've been doing, um, and also a link so that you can go and buy some bonds. Um, and I think the the video <laughs> uh, cat attack. Watch out! Bingo pajama coming in. Oh, soggy moggy. Oh. So um, the 
the video that they made to accompany uh, their work is uh, coming in uh, spring 2020 so um, we'll make sure to, to link to that when it's uh, when it released also put a link to the podcast 13 minutes to the moon uh, we didn't actually directly talk about this but Rob uh, said at the talk he did that he'd been listening to it uh, sort of non-stop and uh, it obviously uh, influenced him uh, he did talk about the moon landings quite a lot I'll put some more information uh, about that crick owl. Uh, there's a few. Oh, how can you hear that wind? Crikey! It is blowy down on the good ship barefoot. Um, so I'll put some some links to some interesting articles uh, about crick owl, the uh, the town that was uh, looking to to move its it's a uh, whole banking offshore uh, I think that's about it um, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and if this is your first time listening then please subscribe uh, you can subscribe to us on Spotify which seems to be a big new big new push for, for podcasts on there uh, you can also subscribe on all your normal and uh, and check out the other uh, interviews we've done uh, I think if you've enjoyed this one you'll definitely enjoy some of those so all the best and until next time see you later